Hello, welcome back to another episode of the Casual Criminalist. I, as always, am your host on this show, Simon Wyman's here, one of my script writers, in this case, Danny. Thank you so much to Danny. Danny actually stars in one of my other shows. This isn't his first script on Casual Criminalist, like maybe two or three. And yeah, uh, he, he moved over to here. I don't know why I'm making this introduction to Danny. It's it's, not, it's just nice to have him here. Uh, this is game show, Darts of Death, the Bullseye Serial Killer. I'm vaguely familiar with this because I think this came up in one of the videos on that other channel. And uh, Danny was like, can I write like a casual criminalist about this? It's a guy who was a serial killer and then he went on game show and got caught. Spoiler alert. And I just feel like... Yeah, I love this sort of like idiocy that people do. Where it's like, bro, if you're a wanted serial killer, what are you doing appearing on TV? Don't appear. That should be like the least place you want to be. Like, if you're a serial killer, don't get famous. Like, you know what you have to do not to get famous? Just don't, just don't get famous. It's not hard. Like, getting famous is hard. And uh, just don't do that. Anyway, let's jump in. Oh, if you're new here to the show, the format here is I've never read this before. It's a cold read. It's going to be fun. We're going to learn about it together. You know, you now know as much as I do about this. So uh, let's go. It's time to go. Follow me to the window. If you're ever contemplating appearing on a TV game show, you're going to need to be tooled up with your killer 30 seconds anecdote. What is that? Eh, these always seem to fall a bit flat in the game shows of the 70s and 80s, in which the terrified contestants tended to look like rabbits in the headlights as they stumbled through a quick story which probably seemed hilarious at the time. Wait, is this like, uh, tell us about yourself for 30 seconds, Michael? And then they're like, well, it's, 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 and it's supposed to be funny and it just ends up being cringe, and then the game show maybe makes fun of them for a little bit. Oh, wait, is that is that what we're going for here? And it's always one of the most awkward elements of a format in which ordinary members of the public are regularly wheeled in and out of every episode. We haven't got the time or inclination to hear their entire life story. We just want to get them to get on with the game that we tuned in to see. So the host of each show usually asks them to sum up their entire existence in a quick soundbite. Boom, I nailed it. Be it in the form of a funny story, an unusual experience, or just a little information about what they do for a living and what it is they like to do in their spare time. So what do you like to do, Michael? Well, I like to kill people jeff <laughs> ah i'm a wanted killer ha 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 just kidding or am i jeff this can regularly lead to such dramatic and insightful on-screen revelations as i once got mistaken for rupert the bear at a crafts fair wait L rupert the bear is literally a teddy bear how the f do you get mistaken for a teddy bear it's not funny it's not clever it just makes me wonder like what the f are you talking about have you smoked so much crack that your brain doesn't work anymore? My wife ran off with a window cleaner, but I didn't pay his last bill, so needless to say, I had the last laugh. I want to myself in the supermarket. I have killed before, and I will kill again. Soon. Oh, so very soon. Oh, no. I was joking, but don't tell me this actually happened. Did someone really say, I have killed before, and I will kill again? Soon. Oh, so very soon. Are you kidding me, mate? The last one might sound a bit unrealistic, and of course nobody has ever said that on a game show, as far as I'm aware. Okay, good. But when Welsh serial killer John Cooper appeared as a contestant on the novelty UK dance-based game show Bullseye in 1989, his typically stiff introduction to the viewers threw up a haunting insight into the rough location of his next double murder. <laughs> what are you doing? Don't go on TV if you're a wanted murderer, and then don't give clues to your next murder. Are you insane? I mean, yes, probably, because you're a serial killer. Unbeknownst to the audience, Cooper had killed before, four years before he stepped in front of the TV cameras, clutching a set of darts, and he would kill again, just three weeks after he walked away from the TV studios in defeat. It was a different kind of game altogether that may have played a small part in John Cooper's journey to the dark coastal path. Spot the ball. Born in 1944, Cooper hails from the gorgeous county of Pembrokeshire in Wales, famous for its epic nature trails, stunning coastal scenery, and Folly Farm Adventure Park and Zoo, which has emus and giraffes and meerkats and everything. Jesus, Danny, what is this? An advert for Pembrokeshire. By the 1970s, Cooper was living... <laughs> Danny just made like a thousand dollars. That was today's unofficial sponsor spot from Danny. From the Council of Pembrokeshire. Money makes the world go around, even your world. 
Uh, by the 1970s, Cooper was living in the hamlet of Jordanston with his wife, Pat, and their two children. The family led a fairly modest life. Cooper mooched around from job to job, enjoying a spell in the building trade and regularly working as a casual laborer on some of the many farms dotted around the county, including one owned by Florence Flo Evans, whom we won't hear of again until right at the very end of today's video. So look forward to that. He was working as a welder's mate in the in a Gulf oil refinery in 1978 when he struck a gusher of good fortune in a spot the ball competition. What the f is spot the ball? <laughs> First launched in there we go. We're gonna get an explanation. First launched in 1923, Spot the Ball was a British tradition, often run in newspapers, in which a photograph of a dramatic scene from a football match is displayed with the actual football airbrushed out of the picture. Readers were invited to pinpoint the exact location, location of a missing ball with a pen, cut out the photograph, and post their entry back to the newspaper to be in with a chance of scooping a big cash prize jackpot awarded to the person who got the closest. This sounds like I was like, wait, how are they going to know? And people, oh yeah, they mail them in. Just the logistics of that. So you've got to have someone at that newspaper's office who's opening all these envelopes, going through all of these things just to award some prize. It seems insane. Like I'm like, how on earth would you do this in the past? And it's like, oh yeah, just, just wasting people's time crazy to the old times these were still all the rage in the 70s and 80s that's like 60 years later i take it back obviously these were amazing with around 3 million people having a go every week right up until the 1990s when it became more appealing to just stick a quid on the national lottery instead with the more enticing potential of becoming a millionaire just 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 consider that for a second three million people every week that is three million envelopes that are being opened by people and looked at the amount of work that is is staggering i can remember that i bet they just like get all of these envelopes they pick out like 10 and then they find the closest one from those 10 and be like yeah yeah this guy won <laughs> that's got to be how you do it right i can even remember that my dad used to play along with spot the ball every week when i was a very little kid despite neither of us knowing anything about football maybe it was a mistake for my dad to entrust me with the responsibility of the pen and i was so far out with my wacky suggestions that i was practically in a different photograph altogether but john cooper clearly had a much better grasp of the ball he managed to pinpoint the exact location during that fateful week's competition in 1978 and he won the jackpot of a new car along with ninety-four thousand pounds the equivalent of over 450 grand today holy shit. that's like half a million dollars or whatever for our international american listeners and jesus that's a lot of money i thought this would be some like you win a hundred quid sort of bullshit Cooper promptly quit his job as a welder's mate and went about blowing through his new fortune as quickly as he could manage oh cooper you just don't i just don't get this like i know this is like probably the majority of people just don't think about like the future very much but i'll be like one mate you've only won 450 grand in today's equivalent you can't quit your job that's not retirement money unfortunately and secondly if you want to be able to quit your job and not have to get another job you can't blow through that money very quickly you have to invest it and then get just most importantly keep your job or it's going to be a couple of years and you're back in a job again except you've got a two-year gap on your cv where you can only put in did lots of cocaine cocaine and hookers, my friend According to local newspaper reports, Cooper was quite generous with his winnings, dishing out £10,000 to his relatives and treating Lucky Pat to a luxury holiday in the US. Cooper's son, Andrew, paints a very different picture, claiming that Cooper was as tight as an otter's pocket and nobody else in the household ever saw a penny of it. The family certainly moved around Pembrokeshire a lot during this period, but Cooper somehow managed to lose a stack of money on each move. The rest of the fortune appeared to have got pissed away down the pub and the local bookies. A former friend recalls, yeah, I feel like the only way to get rid of your money quick than with than uh, via drugs is through gambling and 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 honestly giving it away like people give it away even like when you can't really afford to give it away like if i won 450 grand i'm not going to give any of it away because it's not enough money where you're rich enough to just be i mean sure if you want to give some of it to charity but that's not enough money to make your family also rich you're not even rich a former friend recalls how Cooper often used to fly into a rage down the bookies whenever his chosen horse failed to make it past the first post, which was pretty much every time. He was beginning to earn a new reputation as an unstable and aggressive individual who you were better off avoiding down the pub in case you got caught up in the drama of his uncontrollably violent mood swings. By the early 1980s, Cooper had lost the lot and was back to corned beef sandwiches for tea. 
my nan used to eat corned beef sandwiches. Not particularly good. That sounds great. Uh, when did we say he won it? 1978? So early 80s? Okay, so it lasted him a few years. Not bad. But just in case you were beginning to feel a little bit of sympathy for the down on his like gambler, it's worth noting that the original farm laborer had always been a bit of a beast to his own family. Now, nah, I wasn't really being feeling sorry for him. He won a lot of money that he pissed away. It's like, I'd feel more sorry for him if he hadn't won the money in the first place. Wife Pat lived in constant fear of his mood swings, and it's believed that she put up with years of mental and physical abuse. Son Andrew describes him as a violent, loud, aggressive man who would bounce young Andrew against the walls for minor transgressions, and who once tried to frighten both the kids into submission by pointing a shotgun in their faces and pulling the trigger. You f***ing psycho. The shotgun wasn't loaded. Yeah, this would this would be a very different episode if it had been, but the kids were not made aware of that until after the trigger had been pulled. Even the beloved family pet dog couldn't escape Cooper's fury. When the dog became lame through old age, Cooper decided against taking it to the vets for humane euthanization, figuring it figuring that it would work out cheaper just to take the dog outside and pummel it to death with his fists for over half an hour. I was like, oh my god, he's gonna go all uh oh what's that book? Um of mice and men. He's gonna go all for mice and men on the dog. And it's like no no no, he beats the sh out of the dog until he's dead he has a gun just use the gun that is relatively humane this was not a man who deserved any sympathy but the problem was that it now had a taste of the high life and enjoyed all the trappings of a reassuringly plump bank account even if it was largely confined to drinking and gambling cooper wasn't prepared to let that go and if nobody else was going to hand him another stack of money on a plate for just spotting a ball he decided he was going to have to take it for himself he started a business nah that's not how it goes is it <laughs> It's not going to be like he started a business and it became successful. He became rich. It's like, it's crime. It's definitely going to be crime. Or, oh, well, it could be these TV game shows. But I get the feeling it's going to be crime. Between 1983 and 1997, Cooper was working again as a casual farm laborer, but his main source of income was for spoils of his new career as a burglar. Way it was crime! During this period, the unusually quiet and idyllic villages of Pembrokeshire witnessed an extraordinary spike in often violent burglaries from a mysterious individual in a balaclava armed with a shotgun, which was sometimes used to beat the victims around the head if they didn't play ball as quickly as Cooper would like. I don't think that's burglary. Isn't that robbery? Where you use, like, where you threaten people or threaten them with harm, stuff like that. I think that's what robbery is, and it's a lot more serious than burglary. Cooper would return to the family home late at night with expensive jewelry and coins and other valuable items and stash them away in a locked room of the house without offering a word of explanation as to where he'd been all night. Pat and the children must surely have had their suspicions that Cooper was the new one man crime wave spreading terror across Pembrokeshire. But they would have also been too terrified of the repercussions if they dared breathe a word to anybody else. The police never managed to pin anything on Cooper for 15 years, but the un- <laughs> It's kind of an impressive criminal run. He was a burglar for 15 years, brazenly in a small town, and never got caught. But the uneasy suspicions of the family must have boiled over into downright horror when they were pressured into providing false alibis to the police after the dark events that unfolded in Pembrokeshire on the night of the 22nd of December 1985. 58-year-old Richard Thomas was a millionaire farmer who lived with his 54-year-old sister Helen in the luxurious manor house in the village of Scosverton in Milton Haven, Pembrokeshire, just over a mile from the troubled Cooper home in Jordanston. Three nights before Christmas in 1985, their charred bodies were discovered in the ashes of the first floor of the manor house. Oh my lord, this has escalated. Richard had been shot in the stomach, while Helen had been shot in the back of the head and showed signs of being bound and gagged. The police initially suspected a murder-suicide, which had perhaps been ignited by a dispute over money. It was proposed that Richard may have tied up his sister during an extended altercation and eventually shot her before turning the gun on himself. The fire may have been some kind of accidental consequence of those events. After all, it seems unlikely that Richard would have felt the need to burn down his own house in a bid to destroy the evidence of his own suicide. But, but when the investigations uncovered traces of paraffin liberally sprinkled about all over the place, it became clear that the fire was very much the intentional act of a third party trying to cover 
his muddy tracks. That third party was, of course, John Cooper. Cooper had bound and gagged the siblings in an outbuilding before shooting them. He then moved the body of Richard Thomas to the stairs inside the manor house, covered the whole of the first floor in paraffin, and then set the scene ablaze before making a swift departure from the scene with a few stolen items of negligible value. Bro, if you've, like, gone to rob someone, and I assume it's gone wrong because you've murdered them, like, you've been doing this for 15 years, don't steal their because that's what you call evidence. Like, if the police come and search your house and find that that's going to be bad news for you. That is the one day you don't get to steal people's Cooper was, especially if the items are of negligible value. Cooper was actually known to the Thomas siblings as he had carried out a bit of work on their farm over the years. Cooper had also sold hay to Richard in the past, and they'd often squabbled over the hefty price that Cooper was demanding. It's believed that Cooper may have targeted the Thomas Manor out of some kind of envy of the wealth and success of the siblings, or a personal dislike of Richard, or perhaps because he just figured that he was bound to make a half-decent haul from the millionaire manor. Probably a combination of all of the above. It's also believed that Helen Thomas was home alone when Cooper broke into the manor, and his original intention may have been to carry out one of his signature violent burglaries by slipping on a balaclava and waving around a shotgun whilst helping himself to the riches of the manor. The situation may have spiraled out of control when Richard unexpectedly arrived home and put up a strong fight against the masked intruder. As any potential evidence disappeared in the flames, the police didn't have much to go on. Cooper was actually interviewed by the police as part of a wide hunt for potential witnesses in the local area, but his family made it clear that Cooper had been home all night and knew nothing of what had happened to the Thomas family. The case went cold for decades, and Cooper was free to carry on with his violent burglaries in Pembrokeshire undetected. But in 1989, he hit upon a new idea for trying to grab a bit of free money, which didn't involve breaking into the homes of innocent people and threatening them with the shotgun, he applied to be a contestant on Bullseye. I've talked about Bullseye before on other assignments channels. Boom, I knew it. Uh, but I feel I should explain this distinctly British phenomenon to the casual criminalist audience, and also to me because I've forgotten. And I remember the last time, like it, it came up on the other channel, we were talking about Bullseye, and I was like, I've never even heard of this show. And all the British people in the comments were like, Have you never heard of this show? And I'm like, I don't know. It was, it was also in the 1980s. Well, I, I was just alive. But I definitely don't remember them. The first year I kind of be, can vaguely, like, vaguely remember being aware of was like 1992, 1993. Like, I feel I can remember like writing the date down and it being like 1993. So, like, that's my obviously I remember times before that. But like, that's my first like conscious awareness of dates. This isn't important. Let's carry on. Don't be like that. Bullseye was a rough-and-ready TV game show, which was a curious combination of throwing darts and general knowledge quizzing, clocking up 356 episodes during its original run between 1981 and 1995, and drawing in 20 million viewers at its peak. That's a popular show. 20 million viewers? What was the population of the UK at the time? It's like, what, 70 million today? So a third of the population at the height of this TV show tuned in. That's wild! And that was... It must, let's say, even if it's like 60 million, 50 million. That's like nearly half the population watching this bloody show. That's crazy. Unlike most game shows, there was a refreshingly working class vibe to the whole thing. It wouldn't be much good introducing new contestants by asking them what they did for a living, as many of the contestants would be chronically unemployed or striking minors, beginning to uh, really from the effects of Margaret Thatcher closing down the entire north of Britain. And unlike most game shows hosted by a super slick and slightly greasy presenter, Bullseye was fronted by a warm and likable but largely hapless Jim Bowen, a former teacher and grotty club comedian who managed to awkwardly fumble through each of the 356 episodes as if he'd never really been told what he was meant to be doing. Doing. Whenever he was lost for words, he would simply respond to every new development in the game with his accidental catchphrase, Super! Smashing! Great! The contesting teams would be made up of pairs, one of whom was the darts player, while the other was the quizzer. In one of the early rounds, the darts players would compete to throw the highest score on the board, which would be converted into money if their counterpart quizzer could then answer the subsequent general knowledge question thrown in their direction. Okay. That's not a bad concept for a, for a game show. All I remember about darts, I've watched darts a few times because when I was a kid, it was always like, it was either snooker or darts. And it'd be like, it was, was it, was it Tuesdays or Thursdays? Star Trek The Next Generation was always on from 6 o'clock to 6.45 on Tuesdays. Let's just say Tuesdays. And I'd always watch it with my dad. And sometimes it'd be like, we'd go sit down to watch Star Trek The Next Generation. It'd be like, and uh, Star Trek The Next Generation is cancelled because of the snooker. 
all because of the darts. And they'd be like, oh God, really? We have to watch this? And all I remember from darts is like that a guy would throw a dart and he'd be like, 180 when he like hits it on the triple 20 or whatever. That doesn't make sense. Triple 20 would be 60. Oh, because he throws three darts, so he gets three in a row with the triple 20. 180. And I'd be like, where's Star Trek? <laughs> Why do we have to watch this? <laughs> Who watches darts? <laughs> on TV. There are some rare people in this world who can make absolutely anything into an adventure. And we lived in dark times. Towards the end of the show, the pair who had earned the most money would be invited to face the glory of Bully's prize board in which they could win a range of truly fabulous prizes if their darts hit all the right places. I say truly fabulous prizes, in reality prizes up for grabs are often comically terrible and became the stuff of TV legends. The lucky contestants could walk away with a tease made is that he's made a charming carriage clock a corby trouser press an alarm clock for every room a knitting machine a lazy susie f is a lazy susie why is all this stuff and a knitting machine who the f wants that a mink coat for the ladies well i know those are quite expensive so that's not bad a range of garden tools lobbed into a wheelbarrow or a cuddly pink hippo as jim bowen lay himself later noted in 2016 game shows today are too high tech with one million pound prizes the nice thing about us was that they were excited if they won a toaster there was also good money on for grabs though like uh, i guess not great money like how much are you gonna make throw it? even if you're an amazing dar player the most you can get with each round is 180 pounds or 180 points so if they get the quiz for 180 pounds yeah this isn't this isn't a great game show it's not who wants to be a millionaire is it as the show hurtled towards its thrilling end game the pair of contestants would be given an opportunity to gamble all of these truly fabulous prizes in the final dance challenge if they lost they'd lose everything even the stylish matching luggage and the set of matching gold pens but if they won they'd keep the prizes and also grab the special mystery star prize hiding behind a screen on the studio set these star prizes would often be equally baffling for example i'm not sure how a fitted kitchen could be adequately divided between the two teammates oh i assume they'd always be like husband and wife or something <laughs> and i'm not sure how much use a speedboat would be for a couple of working class contestants who'd probably lived in a council housing estate or a tower block danny everyone loves a speedboat speedboats are awesome it's like jet skis you know it's just it's like, everyone's gonna have a good time he's i don't know it's probably not that useful <laughs> so, how are you gonna move there i gotta buy a trailer gotta buy a car they can haul the trailer with the speedboat on it gotta buy fuel for the speedboat gotta learn how to drive a speedboat other licenses i don't know oh god what a nightmare in a strangely cruel twist the dividing screen would still slide up if the contest if the contestants lost the final challenge as jim burn invited them to take a look at what you could have won the end credits would roll whilst the contestants stood around with gritted teeth as jim pointed out the awesomeness of the star prize that nobody was taking home that day super smashing great jim bowen once described bullseye as the second best dance based game show on television even though there was never any other dance based game shows on television yet despite the shambolic nature of the show there was something quite warm-hearted and genuine about the whole thing and there were many memorable moments thrown up during the 15-year run for example one contestant in a wheelchair was on the verge of winning the mystery star prize when the producer suddenly started screaming in jim's ear to play for time as they needed to switch the prizes but are oh, hiding behind the screen oh no 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 it's going to be something they can't use oh god the producer had suddenly decided that the three-piece leather suite might not be the most appropriate prize to give a wheelchair user wait like sofas wait wheelchair sorry if i'm wrong about this but if you're using a wheelchair you don't live in the wheelchair you're like if you want to watch tv in a comfortable chair you'd sit in you'd move yourself to like a more comfortable chair no i don't know the answer to this because i've never known anyone in a wheelchair closely enough um now i'm wondering let me know in the comments i'm not trying to be insensitive i'm just thinking that you would like a comfortable chair isn't that i don't know oh god <laughs> We're on the same page. The prize was switched, the game returns, and the contestant successfully threw the winning darts. As the audience erupted in applause, Jim Bowen excitedly proclaimed, Congratulations, you've won a skiing holiday. Wait, what the f you replaced a leather three piece suite. You've replaced the 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 appropriate chair gift with a skiing holiday, which is obviously not appropriate. 
Oh my. That was not so courteous. An episode of Bullseye broadcast in 1989 would prove to be memorable for very different reasons. John Cooper had walked into the studio with his eye on the mystery star prize. The episode would have seemed quite unremarkable when it was originally broadcast. The scruffy, curly, mopsed Cooper appeared as quiet and awkward as any other contestant when he and his teammate were introduced to Jim Bowen. Cooper was the quizzer whilst his mate was throwing the darts, and they didn't make a very good fist of things. They were initially knocked out in an early round when Cooper failed to answer as many questions correctly as one of his female quizzer opponents. It was later noted that Cooper would have hated the thought of losing to a woman, with one psychologist even suggesting that the anger and perceived public humiliation may even have been a contributing factor to Cooper's later murderous activities. However, Cooper and his teammate were unexpectedly thrown a lifeline at the climax of the show. Whenever the winning contestants had battled their way past Bully's prize board, the option to take the gamble for the mystery star prize in the final challenge wasn't always taken up. Some of the contestants really didn't want to risk losing their vacuum cleaners or novelty Mickey Mouse clocks. They were happy to tell Jim that they'd have a lovely time, but they'd rather let somebody else have a go. Wait, I thought they were winning money. Weren't they getting, like, cash prizes for all of the darts thrown? Like, if, so if they threw, like, 20 and the quizzer got the question right, they'd win 20 quid. And then they get these prizes as well, and then they get a third prize. I get the feeling this TV show wasn't very complicated, but I still managed not to follow. <laughs> oh, small brain, Simon. I have to read the instructions. And that's exactly what happens. At this point, the next best performing contestants were wheeled back out into the studio to see if they'd like to take the gamble instead. This pair were more likely to take up the gamble, as they would only risk losing the modest amount of cash that they'd racked up during the course of the show. And that's exactly what happened in this 1989 episode. Even though we thought we'd seen the back of Cooper and his buddy, they were invited back onto the floor and accepted the final gamble. It has to be said that the final darts challenge didn't seem entirely fair. While the majority of each episode was intended to show off off the complementing skills of both a darts player and a quizzer, the final challenge was all about the darts. These feel I feel like these are two skills that are just le that they're just pub skills. <laughs> these are skills for people who drink. Because it's like darts boards, I don't know if they're a thing in America, but in the UK, like pubs often have a darts board. There'll be a darts board, there'll be like a fruit machine, uh, maybe a pool table if you're feeling fancy. Um but darts board will often be there. Often be there. I had a darts board in like the, the playroom when I was growing up, and I, I'm still sh darts. <laughs> I never got any better at it. It's not like something I developed as a skill. I just, you just keep throwing the darts against the board. That's it. Didn't get any better. Never became a professional darts player. Disappointing. Could have been a whole different career path. Darts. 180! The simple concept, oh, and also pub quizzes, like quiz, quiz, quizzes, quizzing and darts, pub activities. While the majority of each episode was intended to show off the complementing skills of both a darts player and a quizzer, the final challenge was all about those darts. The simple concept behind the final challenge was to try and hit a score of 101 or above in six darts. But three of those darts were thrown by the non-darts playing quizzer of the team, who often was made to look like a fool by missing the dartboard completely on all three attempts. No, but I could definitely hit the darts board. Cooper and his partner didn't even come remotely close. They were destined to walk home completely empty-handed. Jim Bowen closed the show with the usual taunt of showing them what they could have won as the end credits rolled over the quietly livid face of Cooper. The exact nature of this mystery star prize appears to have been wiped from the archives of television history along with the majority of the episode in question, but I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that it was another speedboat. Reminded that I have to say that after like all the clock talk and stuff and like 180 quid prizes, a speedboat's pretty sick, to be honest. Rewinding back to the very beginning of the Bullseye episode, John Cooper had to go through his usual ritual of encapsulating his entire existence in less than 30 seconds. His employment status probably seemed a bit too murky to explore. <laughs> what do you do? Burglary. <laughs> So Jim went with the safer option of asking Cooper what he liked to get up to in his spare time. <laughs> Burglary. Uh, here's the brief exchange in full. Jim Bowen. You've got an unusual hobby, John, haven't you? John Cooper. Oh yes, the scuba diving. Jim Bowen. Apparently it's the place to do it down there in Pembrokeshire, isn't it? John Cooper. We've got the coastline. We've got the deep water. The mountains. All sorts of things. <laughs> okay, it seems very mundane. What am I supposed to be reading into this? It's not quite on the same level as Jack the Ripper appearing on a 19th century game show to explain that he enjoyed dark alleyways and unsolicited surgical procedures, but John Cooper had been perhaps given a small clue as the coastal backdrop of his next horrific act, which would take place just three weeks after the cameras stopped rolling. Wait, so we're just saying, like, 
I, I guess I don't know what happens, but like he's kind of saying that he's thrown a body in the ocean. I don't know. This doesn't. It feels like a bit of a coincidence, doesn't it? People looked into that. People felt this was more than that. I guess maybe my opinion will change when we find out what find out what he did. Detective Chief Superintendent Don Evans of the Dyford Powys Police Force have been one of the principal investigators into the double murder case of Richard and Helen Thompson. Uh, Thomas in 1985. Four years later, in June 1989, his team were to investigate another local double murder when the son of Peter and Gwenda Dixon reported that his parents were missing. 51-year-old marketing manager Peter and 52-year-old social services secretary Gwenda lived in Oxfordshire but had been reaching the end of a week's holiday in the village of Little Haven in Pembrokeshire, from which they would tragically never return. Six days after they were reported missing, DCS Don Evans and his team made a gruesome discovery in the bracken and bushes of a secluded spot hidden away from the main coastal path. The bodies of Peter and Gwenda Dixon, with mutilated faces, which revealed that they'd been both repeatedly shot in the face. Peter had been tied up, whilst his wife Gwenda was partially undressed. The officers who made the discovery were utterly traumatized by this barbaric scene. John Cooper, in his signature balaclava, had ambushed the middle-aged couple with a sawn-off shotgun as they were making what was intended to be their final walk of the holiday along the clifftop coastal path. Cooper had forced them down to the bottom of a steep gully where he tied up Peter and demanded that he hand over his cash, his bank card, and his pin number. Then he partially undressed and sexually assaulted Gwenda before firing a total of five shots into their faces at point-blank range, with three of those shots surely being fired after the couple had already died. After concealing the bodies, Cooper made off with the bank card, the pin, Peter's 22 carat wedding ring, and Gwenda's khaki shorts. He took to wearing the khaki shorts himself perhaps as some deeply disturbing trophy, even though they were clearly women's shorts and they were far too long for him. In fact, he was wearing the shorts on the very same day that the bodies were discovered. Cooper had decided to spend that particular day in town, withdrawing £350 from Peter's bank account with the stolen card and selling the stolen wedding ring to a local jeweler for just £25. The police immediately suspected an IRA connection as the bodies had been found fairly close to the recent discovery of an IRA arms dump. It was speculated that Peter and Gwenda may have unwittingly witnessed the dumping of the weapons and had subsequently been permanently silenced. But it was later concluded that the graphic scene bore too many similarities to the 1985 double murder. Good for them for connecting that. Wow. Within the space of four years and within just a few miles of each other. Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't realize how close they were. But still, I guess there's not a lot of crime in rural Wales. Two usually sleepy villagers in Pembrokeshire had witnessed two horrific double murders, which had involved shooting the victims at point-blank range. They were almost certainly carried out by the same individual. The murders of Peter and Gwenda Dixon sparked an enormous manhunt. A televised appeal for information on the BBC show Crime Watch generated more than 1,700 calls. I remember, is Crime Watch still around? I remember that from being a kid. I'd be around my nan's house and, you know, there were only four channels, so you'd watch what was on. And Crime Watch will often be on and they'd do like They'd tell people about crimes and they'd be like, here's a photo of the dude or like, here's a policeman sketch. Cool Crime Stoppers on 0800, whatever the number was. I bet they caught a lot of criminals, to be honest. An artist impression of the likely suspect was drawn up and presented to the public after a witness claimed to have spotted a scruffy, curly mopped man in overlong women's khaki shorts loitering suspiciously around an ATM on the day the bodies were discovered. Yeah, mate. D- look, going on TV and wearing women's clothes just around town where you, you know, is, uh, you're gonna get noticed, aren't you? But the identity of the killer remained elusive, and Cooper continued his campaign of terror throughout the 1990s. Oh my lord, okay, never mind, you don't get noticed. You've been on TV. <laughs> you just, well, I guess they don't know what the criminal, the, the guy looks like, so... But oh my. Although most of Cooper's actions up to this point appeared to prioritize theft of valuable items, one distressing incident in March 1996 revealed how he wasn't averse to using violent threats on youngsters purely for sexual gratification. Five teenagers aged between 15 and 16 were wandering through the fields close to Mount Estate School in Milford Haven, presumably with little of value on their persons. They were suddenly approached by a man in a balaclava who was brandishing a sawn-off shotgun. Holy sh**. John Cooper demanded that the teenagers lie flat on the ground to keep quiet as he raped a 16-year-old girl and indecently assaulted a 15-year-old girl. He then fired the shotgun into the air before leaving the scene. Jesus Christ, man. Wait, you're just... Wait, was he wearing a balaclava? Man in a balaclava. Okay, he's wearing his bloody balaclava. Oh, I see you're f***ed, man. Although, as those kids, not seeing his face, you'd be like, he's probably not going to shoot us because we haven't seen his face. But if we saw his face, it'd be like, oh, God, we're f***ed. 
This time, the police concluded from the outset that they were searching for the same man. The incident again bore a long string of similarities with the two double murder cases, including the location, the shotgun, and the cold, calculated violence. The good news and the balaclava. Wait, oh, they don't know about the. Well, of course, they don't know about know about the balaclava yet. The good news is that John Cooper would be arrested and sent to prison just two years later in 1998. I bet it's for something completely unrelated. <laughs> the bad news is that he wouldn't be convicted or even charged with any of his most appalling crimes involving rape and murder. In 1997, John Cooper's 15-year run of violent burglaries in the Pembrokeshire area was finally sent into retirement when he uncharacteristically panicked over a botched job. Cooper had broken into the home of an elderly lady who lived alone in the village of Sardis. Quite incredibly, even though the victim had been tied up and beaten, this brave woman still somehow managed to escape from Cooper and raise the alarm. Cooper fled the scene, ditching his balaclava, gloves, and shotgun in a nearby hedgerow. These were swiftly found by the police and immediately linked to Cooper, who had been spotted near the location. This time, even fake alibis from wife Pat and the children weren't going to get Cooper off the hook, and Pat and the children are going to get in trouble because that fake alibi, that's, that's like obstruction of justice or whatever, right? Like providing fake alibis. That's, uh, that's going to get you uh, into trouble with the coppers. Especially when it's like major, major crimes like this, dude. Honey, he is a psycho! Hundreds of stolen items were seized from Cooper's house, linking him to a long chain of burglaries over the previous 15 years, and also including one or two items which would go on to be of much greater significance in years to come. Stealing from the people that he murdered is would this is gonna catch up to him then. Good. In 1998, Cooper was found guilty of no less than 30 counts of burglary and violent assault, leading to a prison sentence of 16 years. Well, that's not a f***ing messing around sentence, though, is it? By the time he was released in 2009 after serving 11 years, John Cooper had still got away with murder. A few years before his release, Operation Ottawa had been formed in 2006. This was an investigation into outstanding unsolved serious crime in the Pembrokeshire area, led by DCI Steve Wilkins, who had returned home to Wales after a lengthy stint at Scotland Yard to take up his new position as deputy head of Dyfed Powys Police CID. The scope of Operation Ottawa naturally included the two unsolved double murders, by this time known nationally as the Pembrokeshire Murders or the Coastal Path Murders, and the lesser publicized rape and sexual assault of two teenage girls in Milton Haven, all still believed to be carried out by the same individual. The hope was that recent advances in DNA forensic science might lead to a breakthrough that would have been impossible to uncover first time around. The Operation Ottawa team spent a couple of years painstakingly re-examining literally thousands of exhibits that had been picked up from the crime scenes along with the hoard of stuff that was picked up from John Cooper's home following his arrest for burglary. And here's the thing. By this time, DCI Steve Wilkins and his team were already pretty convinced that John Cooper was the serial killer and rapist. Okay, Danny Next Right was a bit of a no-brainer, really, and I'm like... <laughs> Wait, are we connecting... Have they connected because he did all the burglaries? That it also be... I mean, they were violent burglaries, but double murder twice over and rape is like it's a step up isn't it the man went on a violent crime spree for 15 years and these unsolved cases all shared similar elements including the violence the thefts the balaclava the geographical area and the sawn off shotgun okay yeah no you're right danny's right the police are right there's a lot of elements to connect them and then i guess it's not a step up it's just like he's more violent than what he got caught for so fair enough, Danny, I'm sorry, I have a small brain. But Operation Ottawa was still coming up short in terms of compelling evidence that would secure a conviction. They had all the stuff from his house. Surely they can tie some of that stuff. I guess he got rid of it, but he, they said he had loads of stolen shit in his house. They cut, Let's focus on some of that stuff that he stole from the, the manor house, right? And DCI Wilkins was becoming increasingly concerned that unless they nailed Cooper quickly, he would be soon free to strike again. He only served 11 out of 16 years though, right? So why can't they just, can't they just like deny him parole or something? The police be like, yeah, we think, you know, we think he's guilty of this other stuff. And surely that would be like, well, let's not let him out of prison. Let's make him serve the full 16 years. Because it's not like you're punishing him for crimes he didn't do. It's just like you're letting him serve his full sentence, which I think is fine, isn't it? In my opinion, it's fine because we know what he did. Also, 30 years of burglaries, violent burglaries. It's not like he's just nicking from people's houses. He's going in and being violent. He's got a gun. He's wearing a balaclava. It's scary. That is like, wait, like, it's that difference between burglary and robbery. I must be, maybe I'm misunderstanding it or Danny's using the wrong word. But robbery is so much worse because you're scaring the out of people, which is a big difference. 
Like, if someone came into my, if someone broke into my house and stole my TV, I'll be like, oh, someone broke into my house and stole my TV, that sucks. If someone broke into my house, held a gun to me, and said I'm stealing your TV, I'll be a lot more pissed off. I don't know. He revealed, if it was uh, the, the DCI who was investigating this and was concerned about him getting released, if it was Cooper, who we knew was a gambler, we feared he'd soon be back into that cycle of offending. If he was the killer, he would kill again. People who kill like he did, execution style, they enjoy it. The original plan was to keep the new operation secret from the public, and more specifically, from the still incarcerated John Cooper himself, to avoid giving the likes of his wife Pat any time to form strong new alibis on his whereabouts during the murders. DCI Wilkins felt that this would prove beneficial if Cooper still believed that he wasn't under fresh suspicion. Also, if they've shown that his wife Pat has given an unreliable alibi in the past, and she seems to have got away with this, how about just court-wise, we just ignore any alibis from Pat for a husband in the future? Even if it's like, no, he was definitely at home with me and I've got like the Nest camera or whatever was filming us at home, then maybe that's okay. But anything other than that, just ignore what Pat has to say because she know we know she is a f***ing liar and her kids as well. I can't believe they didn't get in more trouble for this. The plan was very nearly scuppered when it was discovered that ITV journalist Jonathan Hill had his own independent plans to produce a new TV investigation into the double murders, which would link Cooper to the cases. Operation Ottawa and Jonathan Hill struck a deal. Hill would drop his TV investigation in return for exclusive coverage of the operation when the radio silence was finally broken. Uh, what was his name? Hill got a great deal here. This is a great deal for him because his TV show, sure, it would be like maybe a interesting show it'd be like you know those podcasts which you know dive into cases or whatever um not not like my podcast but you know these ones that like the investigative reporting style crime podcasts and this with this is like when that is blown open and it's in the press and then immediately this jonathan hill dude's like and boom here is my documentary series about it that's gonna pop off for him that is a nice deal He's a businessman. This may seem a little dickish of Jonathan Hill. He's kind of saying he won't purposefully wreck Operation Ottawa's painstaking two-year operation, but only on the condition that they promise to give him exclusivity of the story for ITV. Um, no, I think this is a mutually beneficial thing. Everyone can win here, and honestly, it's his right as a journalist to go and investigate. If journalists can't investigate because it's currently investigated, but being investigated by the police, that is like that that can be it's not problematic in this case but it could be problematic in other in other situations i think this is just a big win-win for everybody that's just me yet having jonathan hill on side ultimately proved to be a fortuitous move great one of the biggest headaches faced by dci wilkins and his team is that one of the clues picked up during the original appeals didn't really fit with the suspect that they had in mind the artist sketch drawn up in 1989 depicted a scruffy curly mopped guy in overlong women's khaki shorts who was witnessed loitering suspiciously around a cash machine on the day that the bodies of peter and gwenda dixon were discovered the problem is that it didn't look much like the john cooper caught by police in the 1990s who had sharpened up his image a lot at the very least it got a decent haircut and it taken a bath or two. What the police really needed was a visible insight into how Cooper looked in 1985 and 1989, but Cooper had made the task difficult by attempting to destroy every photograph of himself that existed during this period. Oh, but he went on TV and it all comes around! This might have been considered a shrewd move on Cooper's part, were it not for the fact that it had also been careless enough to appear on a massively popular television game show in 1989. DCI Wilkins claims that the operation had always known about Cooper's appearance on Bullseye, but it was a random chat with a local pub landlord which confirmed that Cooper's appearance on the game show coincided with the double murder of the Dixons. And it was journalist Jonathan Hill who managed to track down and achieve the exact episode from the ITV vaults, enabling Operation Ottawa to finally get a good glimpse of how Cooper looked in 1989, back when he was getting beaten on television by a girl. Yeah, this is great I, I i this seems like a nice collaboration between the media and the police to them both win and now jonathan hill's helping them out and i love this they even managed to pick out a frame of the episode which depicted cooper in the exact same stance depicted in the witness sketch and it was a breathtaking moment as dci wilkins later observed in his 2021 book the Pembrokeshire murders wow that's super recent quote you can hardly make it up for the first time we could see cooper as he would have looked at the time of the dixon's murder in my 30 years service I had seen many artist impressions and photo fit efforts, but I had never seen a close as match as this. It was like a tracing. <laughs> He's so f 
fact. I love it. Thanks partly to Jim Bowen and a slightly tacky game show with comical prizes, it was now indisputable to DCI Wilkins that John Cooper was the Pembrokeshire killer. Super. Smashing. Great. But we're still only talking about a witness sketch. This wouldn't be enough to keep Cooper behind bars. Why why can't we keep him behind bars? He can he can do another five years without like right? Sixteen years. Let him go early is a favor, isn't it? Or am I just not? I don't know. I don't know, but that's what I assumed it's like. And there was no further evidence to prevent the release of John Cooper from prison in late 2008. On the very night that Cooper returned to his family home, his pat wife died. Now, I know what you're thinking, and I don't blame you. I don't think he killed her, did he? It's probably just she's overwhelmed with emotion and dies. The police suspected exactly the same thing at first. DCI Wilkins received a disturbing phone call from the police control room at 3 a.m. Hello, boss. John Cooper is phone 999. I think he has murdered his wife. But in fact, it was concluded that Pat Cooper had died of natural causes. After living in terror of her abusive husband for so long, it speculated that Pat couldn't cope with the prospect of that very same terror returning home after an 11-year break from the abuse. As DCI Wilkins put it, this man was an absolute beast, and he was suddenly back in the house. She had massive heart conditions, but I think the poor lady just gave up. Yeah, sorry, I, I said overwhelmed by emotion. I forgot about how uh, uh, what, what a person this man was. She wasn't like, oh, he's home. This is so wonderful. She's like, oh, he's home. F-. It's been 11 years without the prick. However, whilst Patty may have been a reluctant fake alibi for most of her married life, it might have given her some comfort to know that almost two decades earlier, she had quite unwittingly provided evidence that would eventually come to light and help secure the downfall of John Cooper. By April 2009, results were starting to come in from forensics, which finally pointed the finger squarely at Cooper. The shotgun found during the aftermath of Cooper's final botched burglary was, in fact, the very same shotgun that had been used in the double murders, but it had not been possible to make that connection back in the 1990s. Following the Dixon murder, Cooper had painted the shotgun black in the belief that this would wipe away any potentially incriminating evidence. Painting it, yeah, it's gonna. Don't, uh, look, I'm just basing this on CSI, but don't they have like striations from the barrel, mate? I don't think painting that is gonna make a difference. But when the forensics team scraped away this lick of black paint, they discovered that Cooper had in fact sealed in the blood of Peter Dixon. No, you f-ing didn't. It's even worse. It's even worse than that. They <laughs> thought that it's gonna get rid of evidence on the gun. What? Do you not understand how paint works? Have you ever painted... Like, imagine you've got a room that's green and you're painting it blue. It's not like that blue paint is destroying the green paint underneath. It's just under there. Under the blue paint. If you scrape the blue paint away, it's going to be green again. Are you stupid? Fresh discoveries of Cooper's disturbing trophies had also begun to emerge, including a sock belonging to Richard Thomas, which was found squirreled away in a hedgerow close to Cooper's home. But it was those overlong women's khaki shorts taken from victim Gwenda Dixon which would ensure that Operation Ottawa finally hit its target. When John Cooper was arrested again in May of 2009, the police found gloves, a map, and rope in the boot of his car, which perhaps suggests that he was either planning a nippy climbing expedition or he was uh, wasting no time preparing to resume his former career. During a four-day interview, an increasingly agitated Cooper began clutching at straws in, a, in between moments of exploding with anger and lying on the floor in a fetal position. In a touching family moment, he even began to imply that his son Andrew must be the guilty party. Oh my god, that's not a touching family moment. I don't know why I expected it or read it like that. <laughs> it's like, no, it's not going to be this. It's like, it wasn't me, your, it wasn't me. Well, not your honor, because then I'm cause or whatever. It wasn't me, officer. It was my son. You douchebag. As young Andrew often borrowed his shotgun and his woman's khaki shorts. Yeah, of course he did, mate. Yeah, good luck pulling that one off. Cooper did go on to make a fair point about those khaki shorts. The ones depicted in the witness sketch were clearly too long, whereas the only pair of khaki shorts owned by Cooper were significantly shorter. This was true. The shorts had been seized by the police during Cooper's original arrest for burglary in 1997 and were still in storage. As far as shorts go, they're pretty short. But as the police interview was unfolding, a dramatic new slice of evidence was uncovered in forensics tests, which proved that the pair of women's shorts didn't originally belong to John Cooper. In fact, they didn't belong to victim Gwen Dixon either. She had only borrowed them. Cooper's late wife, Pat, had clearly observed that her husband's mysterious new pair of women's shorts were far too long for him. As Pat was something of a seamstress, she had taken it upon herself to shorten the length herself. <laughs> She's like, dude, why are you going around in these women's shorts? Let me at least make them, you know, a normal size. Come on. 
but in doing so she had sealed crucial dna evidence into the seams oh no i wouldn't even think about that that's amazing when the forensics team unpicked the hem they discovered a tiny speck of blood belonging to peter dixon they also came across the dna of the couple's daughter locked into the seam Gwenda had borrowed the shorts from her daughter to wear on a Pembrokeshire holiday, but the daughter had never been anywhere near Pembrokeshire herself. In deploying her tailoring skills on the pair of shorts, Pat had led the police to a piece of evidence which would finally see her abusive husband face justice. This is some excellent police work and forensics works, guys. This is very cool. And DCI Wilkins couldn't hide his elation. He said, It was a real emotional moment. I put the picture of the shorts up with the words, Got the bastard. Great. Love it. John Cooper was charged with the murders of Richard and Helen Thomas, the murders of Peter and Gwenda Dixon, and the rape and sexual assault of two teenagers. Cooper was brought to trial at Swansea Crown Court in March 2011, where the witness included the two teenage girls and Cooper's own son, Andrew, who explained how his father often left the house very late at night with a shotgun concealed under his coat. <laughs> Love it. Shouldn't have tried to <laughs> pin it on me, sh your dad. Your fing old kid. Andrew also informs the court of his father's secret stash of stolen trophies, which were kept hidden in the family home, including expensive items of jewelry and photographs of his victims. Uh oh, don't take photographs of your victims. That's a rule. By this point, Cooper was old enough to start playing the role of the frail elderly figure who was facing a miscarriage of justice. Yeah, yeah, that worked great for Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> Damn it. In jail forever. But he continued to put up a pretty lame and desperate defense. He told the court that the shotgun had actually belonged to a random bloke called Terry, who had passed the gun to Cooper with the words, Do me a favor, throw it off Cladal Bridge. Cooper had allegedly been on the way to the bridge when he spotted a police guy heading in his direction, so he quickly buried the gun in a duck run instead. Doesn't quite ring true to me, though. Here, mate, throw this shotgun off the Cladal Bridge. No worries, mate, just give me five minutes to finish off this pork pie. I'll get right on it. Do you have any dead bodies you need me while I'm at it? <laughs> If someone was like, can you dispose of this gun for me? I'd be like, uh, no. <laughs> what the f going on, man? <laughs> Tell me why I shouldn't go to the police right now, friends. I'm, I'm just not that good of a friend when someone asks me to dispose of evidence. They're like, no. <laughs> Absolutely not. If my friends are watching this, don't ask me to dispose of evidence. We're not that good of friends. The jury wasn't convinced by this line of defense either. Following an eight-week trial, John Cooper was found guilty of all charges and sentenced to a whole life order. That's where you go to prison forever. It's like the uh, uh, life without parole. He angrily tried to interrupt the summing up of Mr. Justice John Griffith Williams by shouting, This is utter rubbish! The jury's been on the internet! I don't blame them! Evidence has been kept from that jury! After warning Cooper to wind his neck in, Mr. Justice John Griffith concluded, You are a very dangerous man and a significant risk. You are very predatory, and were it not for advances in DNA techniques, may well have continued to evade capture. Only you know the full facts and circumstances of the four murders. Much will never be known, because you have constantly refused to stand up to your responsibilities. No doubt you will continue to deny what you have done and not show any remorse. The murders were of such evil wickedness that the mandatory life sentence will mean just that. Legend. Get it. Cooper was dragged out of the court, screaming the truth will one day come out. A big part of the reason why I chose to cover the case of John Cooper is because I can remember bumping into a British writer during an accidental business trip to the Philippines who was convinced that John Cooper was innocent. I sat down with this guy, and we both enjoyed a traditional English fry up on the outskirts of Manila. Danny, what is going on in your life? <laughs> what are you doing, mate? <laughs> and our conversation just happened to turn to the topic of bullseye. <laughs> Here is Danny on the outskirts of Manila eating a typical English fry-up and talking about 1980s TV shows. Okay. By remarkable coincidence, this guy claimed to be writing a book which would prove the innocence of the bullseye killer. Around 12 years later, I've seen no sign of this completed book, and the only other suggestions I could find relating to Cooper's innocence relate to the fact that the seized items of evidence were in police custody for a long time and may have been tampered with. Is there any evidence of that whatsoever? It seems that some Cooper supporters believe that the police purposefully contaminated the evidence with blood from the victims and the DNA of a woman who had never even visited Pembrokeshire in a bid to secure the conviction of a man with a long and terrible history of violent crime in the local area. Not many people seem to agree, though, and Cooper's application for an appeal was, turned, was thrown out of court in 2012. Excellent. Because he, he just seems guilty as sin, doesn't he? 
It's been suggested that we should instead be focusing on the other Pembrokeshire deaths from the exact same period, which were never satisfactorily resolved. For example, you may remember the name Florence Flo Evans from the beginning of this video. Oh yes, we said we'll come back to her. She was a local farmer who occasionally threw a bit of casual work, Cooper's Way, during the 1980s. In February 1989, 77-year-old Flo was found dead in the bathtub in her home of Jordanston, just across the fields from Cooper's house. She was fully clothed and still wearing her slippers. The coroner concluded that it was an accidental death and that Flo must have banged her head falling into the bathtub and drowning. But Flo's family never bought that explanation. The bath had only been half filled and was drawn with only cold water. The front door had been left wide open. Flo always turned off her television via the plug socket, but it had been turned off with the dial. Her purse was missing from the house. Flo's great niece later told the press, We knew it was suspicious. The police at the time said there was no foul play. But I remember, after a post-mortem, an officer telling us, There's more to this. Yeah, it's like... All those little things, like you think her turning off the plug and stuff instead of being turned off with the dial would be some minor thing. But if you know someone and that's how they do things and they didn't do that, I'd just be like, no, that's incredibly suspicious. This person always does that. Why would they not? It just doesn't add up. The really disturbing thing is that John Cooper actually brought up Flo's name in his defense. He'd been trying to explain how his fingerprints came to be found on victim Richard Thomas's car door. Cooper claims that he had been doing a few odd jobs on Flo's farm when Richard arrived in his car to collect something. Cooper had helped Richard put whatever it was into the car and got his fingerprints on the door. But could Cooper have been deliberately taunting the police by bringing up the mysterious death of Flo Evans? Bro, don't taunt the police. If you're already on trial, like you're in trouble for murders, don't be like, there could be other murders. Just shut the f up. He doesn't seem like a guy who is taunting the police. He seems like a guy who genuinely wants to get away with it. And bringing up your other murders, like even subtly, is not in line with wanting to get away with it. DCI Steve Wilkins believes that Flo's house is slap bang in the middle of Cooper's criminal geographical footprints, well it is, and admits that the death troubles him greatly but he is unable to prove the exact circumstances. Much earlier, in December 1966, another double death had sent shockwaves over Pembrokeshire, this time in the village of Langelman in the Preseli Hills. The bodies of 73-year-old Griff Thomas and his 70-year-old sister Patty were found by the local postman in their remote farmhouse. Griff's charred body was so badly burned that only his feet could be identified, whilst Patty was slumped over the parlour table having bludgeoned to death. The police initially launched a murder investigation, but it was later concluded that the grisly deaths were probably the result of a murder-suicide. It speculated that Griff and Patty had been arguing over money. Griff had murdered his sister with a blunt instrument before committing suicide by setting himself on fire. If all of this sounds alarmingly familiar, it's because it sounds suspiciously identical to the initial conclusions drawn over the deaths of Richard and Helen Thomas nine years later in 1985. It sounds almost identical other than the fact that the sister was shot, in that case, instead of bludgeoned, but then there was also the fire, so that's very weird. Friends and neighbors of Griff and Patty claim that the couple were peacefully and deeply religious, not the type to argue over money. It's also worth noting that a bureau in the house had been broken into and a cash box had been emptied. It could be argued that this was too early to involve Cooper, as he didn't appear on the criminal radar until 1985. Yeah, but that doesn't mean he wasn't committing crimes before 1985. But John Cooper was 40 years old when he murdered Richard and Helen Thomas, and forensic psychologist Dr. Clive Sims believe it, believes it highly unlikely that a man would suddenly evolve into a brutally violent murderer at such a relatively late age. Dr. Clive Sims has publicly questioned the verdicts reached over the death of Griff and Patty Thomas and called for a fresh investigation. He told BBC Wales in 2011, It simply doesn't make sense. There are enough similarities between the crimes to suggest that Cooper may at least be a suspect in this case. Is there evidence in, in lockers that could be looked into, though? Because, yeah, I mean, that seems like it's definitely worth looking into. I mean, I know the guy's in jail forever, but it would be nice for the family of these people to know whether it whether they were murdered or whether it was a murder-suicide. Because murder-suicide, that is so intense. I mean, murder's intense, but murder-suicide is just like... I don't know, if it was my grand... <laughs> this is so f***ing dark. But it's like, if they were my grandparents, would I rather them be murdered or it to be a murder-suicide? Why do we even have to ask these questions? But I'd rather them be murdered. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> what the f***?
What we do know for sure is that John Cooper used his incredibly detailed knowledge of the local area to carry out a long series of brutal burglaries, two double murders, and a rape and sexual assault of a minor motivated by greed, envy, and gratification. It's believed by professional psychological profilers that Cooper's compulsion for gambling led to the loss of his original fortune, which he felt equally compelled to recoup by any means necessary. In the words of DCI Steve Wilkins, he is the most dangerous human being that I've ever come into contact with. This was about excessive violence for him, taking somebody's life in order to take property off them is totally justifiable. I think what he hated was happiness. He hated people being happy, and he was constantly watching people's lives. They had shape and reason, and that would drive him mad." End quote. Maybe things would have turned out differently if it never won that spot-the-ball competition and developed a taste for wealth. Honestly, probably. It seemed that that was this big, inciting incident. Maybe things would have turned out differently if Jim Bowen had just let him win a damn speedboat. Now in his late 70s, John Cooper will never be a free man, and as he lives out his remaining days within prison, he'll have plenty of time to ponder over some of the life decisions he made and consider what he could have won. Yeah, good. I'm glad he's in prison. I'm glad he's going to die there. It's where he belongs. Thank you for being here for this episode. I do hope you enjoyed it. If you did, uh, if you're listening, reviews are always appreciated. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, a little like, a subscribe, always welcome. And I'll see you next time.